Do we just take questions? Do we want to take a Q&A session? We should have to take a From the back. You. Yes. Um, it's interesting that at the institute, institute for Creation Research, people joining the so-called faculty are required to take an oath saying they will dis disregard any findings that contradict their faith. Well, um, yeah, the, there are a couple of, there are two different oaths going on here. There's the Creation Research Society, which has a uh, rather well-known oath. The Institute for Creation Research doesn't have members as such. Uh, they do have a graduate school, and there may be a statement of faith for members of its graduate, graduate school, I imagine that there are. The uh, graduate school is actually quite interesting, so that provides me a pretext for more stories. Um, uh, Tim Sanifer, actually, up here in the first, first row, knows more about this than I do, having written a law review article about it. But uh, for years, the Institute for Creationist Research, Creation Research ran a uh, graduate school out of its headquarters in Santee, California, so it's San Diego. Recently, though, they moved, picked up shop and moved to Dallas, apparently thinking that they would be able to still run their graduate school out of there. But it's a different regulatory environment. And they had to um, satisfy Texas that they um, could run a graduate school. Texas, interestingly, have decided that they couldn't. Uh, the ICR is currently suing the state of Texas over that. That should be very amusing because the lawyer for the ICR keeps on submitting 70-page uh, briefs with um, underlining in bold and different fonts and <laughs> general references to Bible verses, generally looking kind of unprofessional. But we'll see how that case plays out. Yes? Uh, I was just curious, can you make about the current association with some German militarism <laughs> on evolutionary theory? And the reason I ask is that I think I've recently been looking at, you know, 19th century you know, biblical criticism. Why got, without any reference to Darwin, the Germans just fucking tore the Bible apart. They just tore it to pieces. It, as, as, as a book, they showed it was basically shreds. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I know myself, I started out as a medievalist, when you start looking at manuscripts, you can see where they've been taken apart, and put back together, and, and redacted by one person after another. And, and what, you know, when, when you actually start looking at the Bible very carefully, you can see you know, many hands, even in a, in a single chapter. But I mean, the, the Germans really were very thoroughgoing in, in their uh, in the, uh, tradition of biblical criticism. And I'm wondering, is there any connection between that and German politics? Well, there's a connection that goes by way of American fundamentalism. And American fundamentalism is in part a reaction to the higher criticism, which you know, didn't yeah. get well with them. Um, but I think in Germany, it, it, the connection is different. The, the main way that concerns about German militarism play into anti-evolution is through a book by a biologist called Vernon Kellogg called Headquarters Knights. And um, Kellogg had been hanging out with German officers before and right around the war and was kind of um, surprised to find the prevalence of you know, kind of biological metaphors in their thinking about you know, what, what it was they were doing in being engaged in the war. And these probably don't trace back to Darwin very, through any very... Like Galton? Uh, not even Galton, but, but probably through uh, people like um, Heckel. Um, but it's, but you know, there are a whole lot of strands of intellectual influence here, and they, they need some disentangling. Um, I think Robert Richards in this new book for Heckel has some, has some discussion of this. But, uh, just off the top of my head, I think not give you a complicated answer. Well, wasn't the uh, Industrial Revolution and uh, the usage of the poor people kind of justified in the lines of natural selection? They, they put it into the economic sense, and it kind of fell into a uh, disrepute on those lines. Yeah. Well, this is something that historians still seem to be squabbling about. Richard Hofstetter, um, very famously late in his book, Social Darwinism in American Life, um, kind of pulled from uh, various things that, for example, Rockefeller wrote and uh, some other robber barons, passages where they seem to be invoking natural selection to explain their, and justify their economic success. Uh, other labor historians, including uh, Robert Bannister, have said, well, it looks like he's kind of cherry-picking uh, quotations from Rockefeller et al. 
uh, there never seems to have been a school of thought that identified itself as social Darwinism. Um, you know, you find people holding up signs saying, I'm a social Darwinist. Uh, insofar as such um, doctrines were accepted, they were seemed to trace back more to Herbert Spencer, who was much more of a social Darwinist, so called, than Darwin ever was. And some people have even suggested that we should abjure the term social Darwinism and talk about social Spencerism. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, these are fairly complicated issues in intellectual history that I can't do justice to. Yes? I read the National Academy of Scientists said they cannot say anything about religion. What stand does the National Center of Science Education what does it stand on religion? The uh, National Academy of Sciences is willing to say things about religion. Uh, for example, they have a fairly thick booklet called Science, Evolution, and Creationism that quotes various um, scientists of faith who accept evolution. And this can have, be very useful when you're confronting people who assume, unreflectively, that it, to accept evolution, you have to give up on your faith. Um, that said, the uh, National Academy of Sciences isn't taking over this position itself. NCSC uh, is fairly similar. Uh, we're not a religious organization, we're not an anti-religious organization. We're a religious and neutral organization whose staff, members, board of directors, supporters have a variety of views on religious matters for each of the military and history of the Christians. <laughs> yeah. Um, the younger creationists or intelligent designers, uh, they're working against the natural selection of Darwin's theory being taught in uh, schools, but are they also tackling all the other subjects in science that are the direct evidence for? Uh, for instance, I mean, uh, radiocarbon dating we learn about in school, I mean, that would kind of conflict with their views or uh, astronomy or any of the other sciences. Yeah, it depends on what flavor of creationists we have like. The younger creationists have to give up on, you know, all of evolutionary biology, but they also have to give up on huge chunks of geology, huge chunks of physics, uh, huge chunks of including cosmology and um, um, areas of physics bearing on radioisotope data like that. Um, intelligent design people, remember, don't have a position on the age of the Earth. So some of them probably are willing to uh, uh, do a little geology bashing or uh, physics bashing. But it's not supposed to be part of their stance qua ID proponents. Um, you also occasionally see a vocational ID proponent who is also skeptical of uh, relativity. Uh, Tom Bethel, who is a journalist who's a fellow traveler of the intelligent design movement, and uh, J. Wesley Richards, who is a uh, DI staffer, have both uh, published these uh, very poorly informed screens against <coughs> special relativity. So, um, Often, uh, often you'll see science deniers of one stripe of being science deniers of another stripe. Uh, there are at least two people associated with the Discovery Institute who have uh, signed one of the uh, petitions uh, claiming that HIV doesn't cause AIDS. Again, that's not part of their positions as intelligent design proponents. On the other hand, it might give you to think about exactly uh, whether these guys are scientifically credible or not. What kind of scientific background, if any, do many of the utility design and or creationist scientists have? It seems that they generally make things that are so misinformed as to the scientific comments about it. I can't have any incredible scientists about all this work. Well, it varies. Uh, Kent Hovind, for example, um, has a, an undergraduate degree from a Bible college, claims to have a PhD in Christian education from Patriot University. Patriot University is not only unaccredited, but Unaccredited, but it's also operated out of a uh, split level in suburban Colorado. <laughs> His dissertation begins Hello, my name is Ken Hobart. <laughs> <laughs> so it runs all the way from the gamut from that to, for example, Michael Beatty, who has a perfectly good PhD in uh, chemistry, I believe, and is a tenured professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University. So the, um, the, uh, the educational uh, levels and attainments you know, can vary widely. Um, that said, you don't see a lot of evolution about it. Do we have a spectrum from the flat earthers that to, you know, 
uh, to the ones who actually believe that, that, that uh, God has this invisible hand of guiding evolution. I mean, there, there's, there's shades of gray and there's stupidity levels. Uh, I, I wonder if we, if we could chart that sometimes with like Carolinas Linnaeus speciation type of way. Uh, there have been attempts to do so. If you go to NCSC's website and look, search for continuum, you'll find a fairly well-known article called The Creation Evolution Continuum by uh, Eugene Scott, which kind of gives you a spectrum starting with flat Earth and getting, and getting uh, more plausible. Other people have kind of schematized in different ways. So yes, there is a range. Yeah. Uh, 